All right, state transition models. Uh, so let me start with uh, with an example. That's uh, usually a better um, better way to explain a concept. So let's say there is a new drug uh, developed to increase the chances of cancer patients. Let's just now assume like general cancer, uh, no no particular kind, uh, to stay in re remission. That means the patients got sick, got cancer, but then like uh, as uh, I'm. Uh, I know that there are some uh, cancer experts in this in this room, so please correct me if I say something that's not exactly clinically correct. Uh, but patients who get cancer can never really be healthy again. They only are in remission where the cancer is sort of sleeping, uh, but they cannot uh, cannot get healthy again. But if they are in remission, they can live. You know, life to the essentially full, uh, almost full, full uh, quality as before, and so this new drug increases the chances of cancer patients to stay in remission. And the cost of new drug is uh, fifty thousand dollars per year. So when patients are in remission, they have to be taking this drug every year continuously to increase their chances to to stay in that health state. And we would like to know if this, you know, this new drug is cost-effective compared to the current standard uh, of care. And um, so let's, when when you have an, uh, a problem like this or the research question like this, the first thing you would do is to think about. So what are the major health states where patients can be? Uh, so patients can be healthy before they get cancer. Uh, they can be in stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four cancer, but I crossed out stage four just to simplify it a little bit. I acknowledge that it exists, but for this, this example, let's just forget that, that it exists. Uh, they can be in remission, uh, but they can also die from, from the disease. And uh, we also know certain things uh, about the disease. Again, this is something that you, uh, maybe you are the clinical experts. When I work on cost-effectiveness analyses, I need to work with clinical experts because I don't have that background in uh, how, how the biology uh, works. Uh, so there may be some discrepancies, but for now, let's just assume this, this is just an example. So we know that patients can get sicker, they can get healthier, but once an individual gets the disease, uh, she cannot become completely healthy again. Uh, patients can have a relapse when they're in remission. Um, patients in stage three cannot have a remission, uh, and patients can can die only from stage three. Uh, so these are the assumptions that, um, in this case, may not really reflect reality. But if you were to do uh, an analysis, you just would have to describe. The disease progression, like the, how how it actually works, uh, to reflect reality to the best uh, to the best you can. We also know that each health state is associated with some costs. Um, I believe these are the costs of the standard of care. So, if patients are healthy, there there are no costs. Uh, if they're in stage one, there are some costs associated with the treatment per year. In stage two, uh, it's a more serious uh, or more severe kind of disease, so the cost of treatment is higher. Stage three is even higher, and remission. There, there's still some costs associated with it, but not as much. When when patients are dead, there are no more costs. Uh, again, there are some utilities, some some uh, measures of quality of life in each of the health state. So for healthy, we assume one, which is perfect, um, stands for perfect health. Stage one, 0.88, stage two, 0.71, stage three, 0.36. Uh, <laughs> and remission is almost perfect, but not quite at 0.95. When patients, uh, when people die, the quality of life is zero, obviously. Um, but we will talk about how, how we value life uh, later today. So. Well, I, I clicked too fast. Uh, I wanted you to think, so let, let's say we have all these uh, health states. And 
let's say we also know that the disease progresses at a pace that patients change from one health state to another roughly once a year or like that's that's how if 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 patients change their health state it would be pretty much roughly once a year uh, that depends on you know on the particular disease if it was a more aggressive disease then patients probably change health states much more frequently but for for this example let's assume once a year and let's say we're interested in uh, evaluating this new therapy for 30 years. Try to think how the decision tree would look like. Start with the decision node. The first decision node would be that you give this new drug, which achieves remission, in say probability is say 50 percent. So it works. In those, it, it works. It will allow the patient to remain in remission and live happily ever after. So perfect state of health for only one. It may not work in say 20, 30 percent. So then disease progresses to stage two, and then three, and then after the death. If we do not give this drug, so that is the other arm of the disease in node. So in some patients, disease will remain in remission and then perfect state of health. Or the disease progresses, so that is the chance, second chance node, progresses to a stage two and then three and then three. And then we can assign these will be values at each. But they can also, when they're in remission, they can go back to stage one. In the next year. The next year they can go to stage two. The next year they can go back to remission. So the next year they Lots of competitions have gone this Like, um, I don't know if you got, to, got further than second or third year. The tree would explode. It would be gigantic and it would be really difficult to make any sense out of it. So what do we usually do in these types of models? We uh, visualize them with what we call a bubble diagram. Um, in, in, the, in a bubble diagram, each you know, circle represents a health state. 
So we have all, all our health states, health is stage one, stage two, stage three, remission and death. And the arrows indicate where can people transition uh, from which health state to another whenever each cycle ends. In this case, by just like the biological way this disease progresses, we decided that one year is appropriate for patients change health states. Uh, so at the beginning, you know, people are healthy, but you can see that, you know, so they can stay healthy until they get the disease. But once they get either stage one, stage two, or stage three, they can never go back to healthy. And once they get stage one, you know, they, they stay there or they can progress to stage two, or they can go to remission. And stay in remission, and then maybe go back to stage one or stage two. Can they directly go to stage two and stage three without going to stage one? In, 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 in this example, yes. Maybe in, in reality, they can't. Um, but in, in this example, they can. Yes? Could be the first point of yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So if, if patients could not go directly to stage two or stage three, there would be just the arrow to stage one, and we would delete these two arrows. Uh, but in this example, we assume that that patients actually can go from healthy directly to stage two or three, and um, so this bubble diagram just shows, it, it visualizes the, the conceptual model of the disease. But to do the, to do the economic evaluation, we essentially would, so the, in the decision tree analysis, we, had, we started with two branches, one for each intervention, vaccination or no vaccination. In this case, we would have two of these bubble diagrams. And one would be for the standard of treatment, and one would be for the new drug. Because in the, in the new drug scenario, the probability of staying in remission would be higher than in the case of um, the standard treatment. On the other hand, patients who are in this health state, they have to be taking this expensive drug. So that will also change the cost of the of the treatment or of the, of this new drug, and um, you can also see that we actually don't know when patients will get into remission. Some patients can get there in like so this would be year one, year two, year three, but some can be you know year one, year two, year three, year five, year ten, then year twenty, and finally get to remission in year twenty five. And to account for this differential timing on, uh, of when patients are in the health state that we're ultimately interested in, uh, or where, where majority of the cost is incurred, um, we need to bring all the costs incurred in all these different health states over time into present value to be able to compare the new drug, the new intervention to the standard of, of care. Uh, so we, to do, uh, this type of analysis is usually called a Markov model analysis. Um, uh, again, that's something that uh, those of you with biostatistics background may already know uh, these types of models. Um, I'm sorry. Explain this Marcos model also. This? Yeah, yeah, I'm just about to do that. <laughs> uh, so it's it's a specific type of model that uh, accounts for the fact that people have different paths of health and disease. They can change change health state uh, health states over time, and it allows for transitions among health states over time. So that's, that's, those are all these arrows. Uh, it consists of a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive health states defined by the disease and treatment characteristics. So by that I mean that these 
health states should really be roughly all that can happen. In reality, there probably is like another teeny tiny health state uh, that's very rare. So this comes again to the art of designing a good model. The model should be complex enough to describe reality well, but don't overcomplicate it because you know if, if there is one really rare health state that will probably not change the results or the conclusion of the model very well. Um, so they're mutually exclusive. Uh, that means that if a patient is in stage one, they cannot be at the same time in stage two or in remission or healthy. Um, and uh, yeah, so I already talked about exhaustive. Um, this is just the set of health states that depends on what condition you're studying. Uh, you're trying to evaluate. <coughs> the, the error? So one patient's, one, one they're dead, they're dead. No zombies in, in this. What is that? The circular arrow. So, 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 so essentially, the circular arrows in all these health states, that means that if a patient gets to, let's say, let's start with remission. If they're in remission, in year one, they can stay there in year two or year three. If we didn't have the arrow, they would have to leave in the next cycle. So the arrow indicates that patients can stay in the same health state for the next cycle, which is or for, for the next time period that we, uh, that we uh, decided on. In this model, we decided that a cycle or the time period would be one year. So if a, if, a, if a person is in the healthy health state, not everyone has to get the disease right away. Some people stay healthy. And some, some people actually will stay healthy for all 30 years. They will never acquire this disease. But in, in the case of death, once they're dead, they're dead. Like there's no way, no way out of here. That's why I thought it can be just a plain circle without the circular sign. Yeah, yeah, so, so I mean, in, in, some public, in some publications, you see it without it. But technically, like, the, if you think about the patients as just, you know, like, uh, items in, in the model, they will get to this health state. And they need to, you know, to, to just, like, allow for the mechanism of this model to work, all of them that are in this health state will just like circle back and stay there, stay, stay where they were. But some new can arrive in each cycle. So shouldn't there also be an arrow from remission to stage three and from all other states except stage three for death from other causes? Um, in reality, yes, absolutely. Uh, sometimes, Sometimes you can see in the literature that people even distinguish uh, two health states. One, uh, one is death from the disease and death from other causes. Uh, essentially just to track how many people actually died from the disease and how many were just hit by a bus and there was nothing, uh, it had nothing to do uh, with the new treatment. Uh, so absolutely, in reality, yes. Again, this is just an example and we made some uh, some assumptions here that patients can die only from stage three. That's just an assumption of this, this particular model, but in reality, absolutely. Um. Yeah, so uh, at any time in the model, each patient in the cohort, uh, you know, remember in the vaccination, we started with some population and ultimately distributed everyone to three different states, essentially. Uh, healthy, flu in the hospital, and flu not in the hospital. So that's something similar. Like at any time, in, in, uh, at any time uh, each patient is assumed to be in one and only one of these health states. Patients cannot be at two health states at the same time. Um, in a Markov model, time is represented by cycles of a fixed duration. Uh, that the length of the cycle depends on the disease. If it's an aggressive cancer, maybe like a daily cycle makes sense. 
or weekly. In this particular example, this is not a very aggressive disease, so we assume that a year is, is appropriate time frame. Excuse me. <coughs> suppose the patient can go back to the initial state. Then, suppose the patient can go back to the initial state. Yeah. 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 If we assume that the patient can go back to the initial state, then we can upgrade the marker. What, what initial state? Like if we, we are not, we are so let's say if we assume that, we would just draw arrows here. Then uh, can you apply this Marcos model there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you just draw arrows and allow patients to transition back to healthy. So the way how this, this, this is operationalized is that at the end of each cycle, patients transition across health states according to a set of defined probabilities. And uh, um, so essentially what we assume is that for the duration of the cycle, in this case one year, everyone stays in the one health state they are you know, at, at that particular time. And at the end of the cycle, Patients transition, like change health states, essentially in no time. And um, same as in the decision tree, where the distribution had to, uh, the probability distributions always had to add up to 100%. Same thing here, transition probabilities always have to add up to 100%. It just means that the number of people in each health state, all of them have to go somewhere in the next cycle. They can stay there stay in the same same health state but there would be some probability of staying in that health state um, again in real reality it probably does uh, but the way to make this model work you just have to assume that there is a fixed duration of the cycle let's say Let's say if uh, you know staying healthy, uh, well, maybe transition from stage one to stage two would happen maybe on average once a year, if if at all. But the transition from stage two to stage three would happen weekly, you know, like very very fast. Essentially, once you get to stage two, going to stage three can happen very fast. In that case you would assume a constant seven-day weekly time frame for the entire model. And essentially, you, you take the minimum time frame appropriate for the particular condition in, in question. And so uh, during that time, let's say in a year, uh, patient will be transiting at different time points. But whatever happens, we assume that if it happened, at a particular day at the end of the year or something like Yes, yes, it, and I will talk about how to adjust for this uh, by the end of this, this slide deck. Uh, absolutely, like patients, it, it doesn't happen that everyone waits for December 31st to transition to a new health state. Uh, patients transition to health states over time. Uh, but for the modeling purposes, again, it's abstraction from reality. No model is right. Uh, but they can still gain, uh, help us get, gain some insight. All right, so uh, there are some assumptions uh, for Markov models, and um, some of them can be relaxed eventually, but you know, to, to start slowly, uh, essentially not to overcomplicate things. Uh, the most simple Markov models assume that the probability of transitioning from one health state to another uh, depends only on the current health state. So what that means is that the probability, let's say from stage two to remission, uh, there's no, yeah, yeah, there is, from stage two to remission, it, that probability depends only on on the fact that the patient is in stage two, and it doesn't depend on whether the patient was in stage one before or in the remission before, and just return to, to stage two. It just depends only on, well, the patient right now is in stage two, 
and there is some probability of remission. That can be restrictive in certain cases, and it can be relaxed uh, eventually, but for now, let's just take this as, as, a, as an assumption of the model. Um, yeah, so it, sometimes the model is called memoryless. It, it doesn't have memory where, the, where the, each individual, in which health states, uh, which health states they already visited before where they resided. Uh, the transition probabilities remain constant over time, which again can be relaxed, can be incorporated in the model. They can change over time. But for now, let's assume they, they stay fixed. The probability of transitioning from stage two to remission is, let's say, 10% in year one or in year 25. It just remains 10%. Um, Another assumption is that individuals stayed in, in the health state for the entire cycle length. Again, not exactly precise, but um, it's necessary for uh, making the model work. And the actual transition from one health state to another happens immediately. You have to the yeah, yeah, you should. You should. So, so these are assumptions of the most simple Markov model in general. Uh, but you can, I'm sure you can imagine that the pr probability distribution would be a function of time. And in that case, you, you can essentially realize this assumption. Usually that uh, the Markov model concept tells you the state of disease today depends on the immediate earlier stage. So no matter what, I had the history. Uh, so t minus two, t minus three, t minus four doesn't depend on that, those things. So it's basically uh, uh, immediate next, immediate early stage. So t minus one, x t the value given x t minus one, the immediate earliest stage, equal to x t now given x t minus 1, t minus 2, t minus 3. So a whole lot of history is not important. That is an important assumption we have in Markov model. But we need to see whether my data satisfies this before I use this Markov model, especially transition probabilities. So sorry, still I just get data that is Yeah. There are ways to validate whether your data follows that assumption. I assume that uh, I have stage three today. Um, uh, last month or uh, six months ago, my stage was two. So earlier stage one, whatever. So the theory says that you don't worry about what has happened six months ago, just prior to your current state. Is that enough? So that, that is an important assumption we have in Markov model. Yes, sir. In most cancer therapies, what happens is that most recurrences will occur in the first two years or so. If the patient has remained disease-free in remission, then and has received most of the therapies, you know, chemo, radio, everything, then the probability of developing progression is very, very low. So after five years, it becomes even lower. After seven years, it's very, very low. After 10 years, very negligible, no point person. But so that third assumption, transition probability remain constant over time is not met with in many cancer therapies. A absolutely, so that's what I mentioned when I, um, that's what I meant when I said that this is a, an assumption that you can eventually relax. <coughs> Uh, you can think of, you know, like the transition probability can be a function of time. So depending on if you're in cycle one, two, three, or five, well, but that actually d doesn't track the actual individual patient. So you would need some individual patient trackers. So the model can get very complicated 
to account for exactly this reality that in you know uh, in this example that you're giving is probably very important to, to account for that um, but for now just like to get an idea how the Markov models work let's just assume that's not the case let's let's assume that the transition probabilities remain constant and doesn't change over time uh, but I'm sure after you understand the basic mechanics of this type of these types of models you will see how you could modify that to account for how long the patient had you know the disease and then how that particular patient's probabilities change over time there are, um, uh, there are, um, <clears throat> this is uh... You see, you segment the time period in the discrete data every six months. So the four, within six months, we assume that transition probabilities are the same. But if we say it is the probabilities are expected to change every day, every week, every month, and then it called process. This doesn't deal with the process. Time changes. So this is a discrete time interval. Therefore, it is easy to deal with. So, so that, that is... Uh, we are not dealing with the uh, Markov process. This is just the Markov chain yeah. with a discrete time space. So, so every six months you talk about the transition. Within six months, the probabilities are expected to be similar. That is it. All right. I think this is actually a very good point to to pause. It's time for a coffee break. Absolutely. Yeah. The last line says transition among states happens in no time. Yeah. So except in say atomic bomb or gunshot or accident, major accidents where things happen suddenly. Yeah. In all other diseases, infectious or cancer or other degenerative arthritis, it's a gradual process. And for a long time, person will remain disease free, asymptomatic. And then gradually he or she will develop disability or disease. So, what do we um, for that? <coughs> this is a model. It it's not perfect. Uh, this is just a, an, an assumption we have to make. Um, you're absolutely right. In reality, things usually gradually change. Um, but for modeling purposes, we just assume that people are in one health state for whatever cycle length we decide, uh, and then transition within just like a split second. Does it relate to that transition point, like zero to a day between six months to the next six months? So if you have a given happening, then it happens in no time. Is that the concept, or is it like, so we see the problem is, when it's no time, how short is the no time right? The one transition cycle. It doesn't remind the finite cycle time. Um, so like if the transition happens on say one seventy ninth day. Yeah, so um let me actually use this use this board. So, this so, so you, you have a like stage one to stage three. You you have a time continuum. Right? So you have a time continuum. And you decide that this is an appropriate cycle length. Let's say this is one year, this is second year. And a person can be, you know, like, we all just travel through this time continuum. Uh, and a person can, you know, be healthy, healthy, and then suddenly change to sick here, and then, like, stage two here, and stage three here. That can happen. Uh, but that would be difficult to model, and it's possible to do that. But uh, before we make the models way too complicated, for this, uh, just to illustrate the concept, we use the, uh, this very simple model that just assumes, based on the disease, uh, this particular disease that we have in this exercise, we know that on average, if we follow people uh, with this particular disease, 
we know that most of them stay in each health state roughly a year, or at the minimum, roughly a year. Maybe three years, maybe 10, but the minimum amount of time each person stays in a health state will be a year. So that's why we decided, all right, a year seems an appropriate cycle. And then, so we will, you know, this person will be, for example, like healthy, 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 healthy. And even though in reality they switched to stage one here, we just will keep them in the healthy health state until this particular moment. And at that time they will switch to stage one, stage one, and so on. It's a, it's, it's a simplification, it's not perfect, but that's just how we, how we do this. Thanks. If you really want to be uh, precise, you can build a model that allows for transitions at any time. Uh, but it would be difficult, it, that, that would be very difficult to do. It's doable, but now, for now, just to explain the concept, let's just stick to the assumption that the cycling is fixed and transitions happen within no time. All right, so let's take a look at this um, this uh, bubble diagram again. Um, I have the cycle length here, so we decided that one year is appropriate. And uh, how would we implement the transition probabilities in a model that looks like this? And now try to stay with me because this is going to be overwhelming, probably. Uh, ah. There are actually a few more slides, sorry. Uh, so one assumption that we make is that the cycle length uh, remains constant throughout the entire model. Um, but how long the cycle length should be, that depends on the disease. So what is clinically relevant? Uh, if, if it's a disease that, you know, it's, it's not like this very new kind of disease that was just uh, just discovered somewhere in the rainforests, uh, if it's like TB or breast cancer, people have done this, maybe for a different kind of intervention. So that's the easiest way how to decide how, uh, what cycle length is appropriate for the, for the particular disease you're interested in. You will just look what others did. Um, but, uh, when you're selecting the cycle length, one thing to keep in mind that you will need to find appropriate transition probabilities between health states that are appropriate for that particular time frame, the cycle length. So let's say if, uh, if you have transition probabilities that people on average, like there's a chance that someone who's healthy will get breast cancer is 1% within a year, but for some reason you decide to use a cycle length of one month, then you will have to adjust the probability accordingly. Um, all right, so now we will talk about the, how the transition probabilities would be implemented. I color-coded the health states just to make it more visually clear where, where each probability applies. And the probabilities, uh, the transition probabilities from each health state to another would be something that you would have to find all of them. Essentially for each arrow, you have to find a probability somewhere in the literature or estimated yourself. Um, but you can see you know, that there are many arrows, like there will be many transition probabilities in this kind of model. Uh, so let's say we find that to transition from uh, from the healthy health state, there are four uh, different paths. People who are healthy can stay healthy, and the probability of, of doing that is 92% in this exercise. The probability to, of transitioning from, stage, uh, from healthy to stage one is 5%, to stage two, 2%, to stage three, 1%. You can notice that essentially, the probability distribution that uh, the probability distribution adds up to 100%. It's essentially all the arrows that go out of a health state 
they need to add up to 100%. Um, I've, I've mentioned that before. It essentially means that no matter how many people, people are in the health state in the current cycle, in the next cycle, they all will need to go somewhere. They can stay healthy, but they just like need to need to have an assignment for the for the next health state. Are we assuming every cycle this would remain the rate? Yes, yes. So in, in the simple Markov chain model, we assume that this probability remains constant th for the thirty years that we decided to use. Um, again, other more sophisticated, more complex models can allow for this probability to change over time. Uh, but for now, let's, let's, I think it will be overwhelming enough even if we assume that they remain constant. So for stage one, we have these probabilities. There's, for people who are already in stage one, they have 65% chance that they will stay in that same health state in the next cycle. 10% that they will move to stage two, and 25% that they will go to remission. Uh, again, these three probabilities, those are the all arrows that go outside of stage one health state. And these three probabilities add up to 100%. For stage two, same thing. In this case, we have four potential transitions. Stage three, we have these transition, transition probabilities. For remission, we have these. You can notice that all of them add up to 100%. Finally, those who are dead remain dead. Uh, this is when I put all of them into one slide, um, which this is the reason why I color coded them. <laughs> uh, that you can, like each color, you know, so that it's clear that 10% means that, because it's yellow, it means that it's going out of stage one, while 5% is going out of stage two back to stage one. So let's try to figure out how, me, how people will, you know, change these health states with each cycle. So now we're at cycle zero. Now we're at the beginning of the analysis. We assume that we have a thousand people and they all start in the healthy health state. So at the beginning, everyone's healthy. We know that in the next cycle, 92% of those people who are healthy will stay there. 5% will go to stage one, 2% will go to stage two, 1% will go to stage three. So if we go to cycle one, we get exactly that, right? So of the original 1,000 people who were in the healthy health state, 92%, 920, remained healthy. 5%, uh, so 50, went to stage one. Uh, 20 went to stage two, 10 went to stage uh, three. But, so, to calculate how many people are in each health state, you actually have to focus on the arrows that come in. So to get these 920, that's easy because that's the only arrow that went back to the healthy health state. So we took just like 1,000 times 92%. To get these 50, <coughs> how many arrows are there to get to the stage one health state? Right, so there's the one coming from healthy, there's one coming back from stage one, there's one coming from remission, there's one coming from uh, stage two. So we, there were 1,000 people in the healthy health state and 5% came, so that's 5% of 1,000 came in the stage one. 65% of the original zero came back to stage one or stayed in stage one. 10% uh, Oh, this, 10% came from remission, but there were zero patients in remission. And 5% came from stage two, but again, there were zero patients in stage two. So this is, so, so I, I hope so far so good. Let's go to cycle two. So 
Of those healthy, there were 920 people in the healthy health state, and only 92% of them stayed in that, the same one. So we would multiply 920 by 92%. That's the number of people we need uh, that stayed in the healthy health state. To get to stage one, now it's getting a little, little more tricky. So 5% of the 920 came there. Um, of the 50 that were there in the previous cycle, 65% stayed there. 10% came from remission, but there were zero patients in, in the cycle one. But there were already 20 patients in stage two. And 5% of them came to stage one. So we multiply, you know, we sum these four products to obtain 79 and a half. So uh, I think I have one more slide for how to get number of people in stage two. There are one, one, two, three, four, five arrows coming into stage two. So we would get 2% of those coming from healthy, 60% for those staying in stage two, 10% coming from somewhere from stage one, then 5% coming from remission, and 5% coming from stage three. Let's go to stage uh, cycle number three, and I'll have you do this. <laughs> <laughs> And I can take a break. So I will, I will leave this here. And <laughs> let, let, let's try at least a few. Let's try at least a few. They want the software. <laughs> By the way, this is what you will have to implement in Excel. So are you already excited for that? <laughs> so. You, you see, so the, these are the, the numbers in cycle two. So try to fill in, yeah. So these 92%, 5%, 2%, 1%, these values are literature based, right? Yeah. No, no, this is just an educational example. Yeah. But, but, but in practice, yes, they would be literature based. Can you just uh, elaborate how to extract from the literature? Uh, you would. Um, I think that these would be probably epidemiology, epide epidemiological studies that would report uh, how patients transition from one, one health state to another. Um, maybe even in some RCTs for certain interventions, they would describe this. Uh, but to be honest, like finding these data is hard. So, uh, in the, so you would find the probabilities based on some samples. Yes, there would be potentially some error, some bias in the, in the estimates. But the thousand people that I started with, that is just the cohort I'm interested in. If the assumption here is that I want to find out if this new drug would be cost effective, but I also want to know if I were to implement it, if I found, find out that it actually is cost effective, I would like to know how much it actually will cost. Do I have the amount of money in my budget? And I know that there are a thousand can candidates for this treatment. You know, you, you know that there are maybe a thousand people with this particular condition, and you would like to know what would be the cost for this entire cohort to get the new treatment. If, the, if, if your disease of interest is more common, you would use a different number. But that is essentially, the, the original 1,000 people does not affect the conclusion of the cost-effectiveness analysis. It doesn't affect the ICER. Specific thumb rule to say you must have at least so much of it. I'm sorry? So there's no thumb rule so much as to say that you should have at least a minimum of so many number of them. No, it's. It, with, let's say 10,000 instead of 1,000. So it's not going to change the ISA. No, it's not negative. But can I do it with uh, 
85 people there to make this. Yeah, yeah. It, it will not change the ISR. It will only affect the estimate of the total cost of the intervention. And so if you want to know how much this would actually cost to treat whatever population of interest would receive this, this intervention, you know, if, if, it's, if it's, for example, a screening program, that would be implemented to everyone within that age or sex group. But if it's a treatment of this particular disease, not, not everyone you know, has the disease. So um, yeah, that, that is essentially ju just an assumption. Uh, the question was whether we should subtract people who are leaving health states. And uh, the short answer is not really. But technically, like, you do it by, but you kind of inherently do it. So for example, in uh, stage one, if we take stage one, uh, Yes, some people are leaving. Some people will leave to remission. Some people will leave to stage two. Uh, actually, 35% of them will leave because 65% will stay. So if we count only those 65% who will stay, by doing that, we account for the 35% who have left. How many do you, how many are going to stay healthy? Seven. Correct. How many will be in remission? I got 41. Point, point oh eight. Uh, let's do stage three. It's, it seems that at least most of you got the right numbers. So that's, that's good, that's, that's uh, great to hear. Uh, the results are just like a few slides down the road, so you can just look at that. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you got it right. <laughs> so I will, I will keep going and uh, we can talk about this. Um, if, if needed, we can talk about this, this later again during the, the practical uh, exercise. To be honest, uh, getting the number of people who reside in each health state in each cycle is the most tedious part of uh, Markov models. Assigning costs and utilities is not such a huge problem once you know how many people are in each health state. Um, so in, in general, in, in Markov models, we have uh, incremental rewards, incremental costs, and incremental uh, utility values, or in, incremental health effects. Uh, that essentially means that these costs and utilities are accrued by the people who are in each particular health state in each particular cycle. Um, so each health state should have some costs and some utilities. Uh, by that I mean it's okay to have zero cost or zero utility. The death state have exactly that. Uh, but it, each health state is associated with some costs that can be zero or any, you know, yeah. any number and some utility. And uh, to get the total cost for that health, health state for each cycle, you just multiply the costs by the number of people who are in that health state in that particular cycle, and you get the total utilities by multiplying the utility value for that health state by the number of people who are in that health state. Once you get this for each health state, you get this for each cycle, uh, and then ultimately sum all of them into total costs and total effectiveness. Once you have that, you can calculate the ISER as the difference between the total cost of one intervention and the other intervention, dividing by the difference between uh, the total, total effectiveness. Uh, so in, in, this, um, in this example, or at least in the exercise, we will consider a 30-year time horizon. That 
the length of the time horizon, do I actually have a, I don't think I have a slide on that. Uh, the time horizon should be, that depends on what is the decision maker interested in. You can see many models that use a so-called lifetime time horizon, which essentially lets the model run until everyone is dead. Uh, that it also often serves as a validation because you shouldn't see people still being alive 300 years from now uh, if you start with a fixed cohort. Uh, so if, if that is happening, that means that your transition probabilities are likely not right uh, or do not really reflect how, how it works on this earth. Uh, but what is really important about incremental rewards? Do not forget about the discount rate. That's why we talked about that. Uh, because any future costs and any future health effects should be discounted to the present value so that we can compare intervention one and intervention two. Because if intervention one means that all the costs will be accrued immediately and health effects later while the other intervention will be vice versa, all the health effects will happen immediately and costs will happen later. As we saw on the example with the tuition, the two, well, cash flows or health utility flows would not be comparable. So we need to bring all of them to the present value to be able to compare them, to make a fair comparison. Sometimes what we see in Markov models is that uh, sometimes we see something called initial costs or initial rewards, initial costs and initial utility values, and final costs and final utilities. Um, these depend on the particular question, but what can be an initial cost is maybe we're evaluating surgery. We would do the surgery in just cycle one, and that would be it, or it would be a fee to buy in this program. You know, you pay your fee and you're done for a lifetime. Then you are part of this program and then things happen. So if appropriate, this can be done easily. You just, you know, apply the initial cost and initial utility at the very, uh, in the essentially zero, zero cycle before, um, before the model uh, starts rolling. Final costs are the same thing. Uh, an example could be um, cost of a funeral. Uh, that is sort of a final cost. Um, but um, final costs usually occur in the future. So again, do not forget about discounting. There are many uh, analyses that do not really have any initial or final costs. It doesn't mean that you have to have, to have them but sometimes they're appropriate. The discounting is only for the cost or also for the utility values? Also for the utility values. That's, that's the controversy. It doesn't make much sense to use the financial markets discount rate for health, but we just don't have a better, better measure. So therefore we use the, the same discount rate. That is currently the recommendation, however, if someone else was delivering this workshop and they were in the opposite camp, they, they could tell you like, do not discount health because it makes no sense. Uh, I acknowledge that. I will not tell you that it's wrong. I'm just telling you that the latest recommendation is because we don't have anything better, let's just be consistent and discount health effects the same way we discount costs. Aren't we already doing that by assigning the different quality to uh, patients uh, sometime down the line? Let's say somebody, it's a model which runs for 30 years. So when somebody is at, uh, you know, initial part of the cycle, his 30th quality is 1. So after 30 years, when you assume that he may be in any stage, but his quality will fall down to maybe 0.65 or 0.75. Um, have we already done that with that? So technically, yes. But again, the way the model is set up is that you only transition in health states. Okay, not in the age states. Fine. And, but you can, it, 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 it's a, you know, like, it's debatable whether, whether a healthy 80-year-old 
what does it actually mean? Like, is it really someone who can jump, uh, climb trees and jump from walls? Or is it just like a generally healthy 80 year old, but they, everyone has their own, own, um, own little aches here and there? Uh, so the health state should represent sort of the quality of life. And within each health state, the, the utility is constant. And it doesn't matter if it happens today or 30 years down the, down the road. Um, technically, you could account for this by having health state of just like a little worse healthy, a <laughs> little worse healthy, and so on. All right, so. Uh, Initial cost is what you put in as for each health state, right? Like example, we said in this stage one, the cost is going to be a particular value. What is final cost? Uh, so you don't necessarily have to assign it to every single, <clears throat> sorry, every single uh, health state. Uh, neither the initial nor the final cost. It's just so each analysis has a beginning and an end. That's the time horizon. Starts at some point and ends at some point. Incremental costs would be accrued in every cycle, while the initial costs are <coughs> accrued only at the very beginning and never again, while the final costs are accrued at the very end, essentially at the end of the time horizon. They may not be appropriate in some situations. They may be appropriate in, none, in other. I'm just telling you it's an option. Uh, and uh, if appropriate, people do this. So if you were to design a Markov model, uh, first, the first thing you need to think about is, well, it's not even on the slide, but the first thing is like, what's the research question, right? What are you trying to compare? Like, what's the intervention? What's the com comparator? What's the population of interest? And once you have that, these very essential uh, items, then you can think about the natural disease pr process, how this particular disease works. Uh, it's, very, it's a very good idea for those of you who don't have clinical backgrounds to have someone who does. Um, because sometimes, uh, I know this myself, like I think that diseases work in a certain way and that's not exactly true. So it really is helpful to work in teams and have different skill sets. Um, some clinicians may not have all the, all the technical uh, knowledge, uh, but um, also not all economists have the clinical knowledge. And um, both, of the, both of these skills are essential. So think about the, how, how the disease works, how fast it can, how fast it can progress. <clears throat> Uh, think about how the strategies that are evaluated can alter the progress of the disease. Um, obviously, the primary outcomes of treatment, other outcomes, uh, adverse events, side effects, and so on. Um, it's really important to think about what actually generates costs. If there are some events that, you know, like, generate essentially pennies. It doesn't matter as much as events that are really costly. Hospitalizations are usually a good example of that. Um, yeah, how fast the disease progresses, that, that dictates the, the cycle length. And uh, ultimately, how, how far along, uh, for how long the, is the strategy implemented and how long the effects can last. There are some strategies that can have only immediate effect and they fade out within two years. So there's no need to do a lifelong type of analysis. But if the new drug or new surgery, if, if, if this intervention has effect that can affect your entire life or the patient's entire life, then a lifelong uh, time horizon makes sense. Uh, Dr. Jesselin already uh, briefly touched on this. Uh, so what I talked about so far is a Markov chain or Markov cycle model. All right, uh, 
Yes. So if I understand one strategy, uh, the model will remain same in both the strategies and only the probabilities will change. And then you run the, uh, both the strategies. Pretty much. The structure of the model will likely remain completely the same. Maybe, you know, like, you can, s theoretically, I can think of an example that one one of the health states would never happen under, you know, a certain, <laughs> certain strategy. But in general, like, the structure of the bubble diagram would remain pretty much the same. But, it, <clears throat> sorry. <coughs> But the, <clears throat> the transition probabilities would change, but also the costs could change. And uh, maybe not necessarily the utility values, because those should correspond to the health states. Um, but it, each health state can have a different cost. If it's you know like a different kind of treatment, in uh, this example, um, what we talked, uh, what we considered at the very beginning is that the cost of treatment per year for patients in remission is 1,100 rupees. The new drug costs 50,000. It would replace the cheap 1,100, 1,101. So the cost would change as well. But it's essentially just the parameters that change across between the two strategies. And then you compare both the uh, both the ISO. Well, you will, if you have two strategies, you will have one ICER. But you compare the total cost and total effectiveness of each of them. Can this be combined with that RCT or do I need to plan separate? Absolutely, you can do this like on the side. Why are you doing that RCT? So if, if you're actually prospectively doing an RCT, you don't really need a model. You can just track the costs along with tracking all the effects of you know one intervention versus the other. If if you have a way to track all the costs, you know, in, in this particular case, you may be able to track the cost of the treatment, but you may not be able to track the, uh, you know, things like uh, if the patients had to come to the to get the treatment and pay for, you know, to travel, uh, if they had to take time off work, that might be, might not be as easy to track within the RCT. But you can probably fairly easily track all the costs associated with the treatment in both regimens. Uh, but also, like a model can be done. Also, you know, like it, it may make sense. Uh, but uh, if you prospectively track patients, you don't necessarily need a model. If you don't have patients, then a model is pretty much your only only option. <coughs> Sorry, but when you say, uh, when I don't have patients, then I'm getting data from literature. Yeah. And that's when I'm going to work. Exactly. Exactly. So, comparing with the, the new drug with the existing one, how do you know the transitions with the new drug? So, um, in here, uh, so these probabilities, now I actually don't recall, but let's assume these are the probabilities under the current standard of treatment. Uh, we know that the new drug improves the chances of patients if they get to remission. It improves their chances to stay there. And now I forgot the actual number, but maybe this 85% would change to 95%, which would inherently have, have to change the, the transition probabilities to, for leaving remission. So maybe this would be 95% and this would be two, and well, this would be three and this would be two so that they all still add up to 100%. So where does this information, if it is totally a new drug? A trial, yeah. So if it's a new drug? Well, if it's a new, new drug, you first need to, in order to put a, put a drug on a market, you first need to establish that it's, 
effective. You would first need to do an RCT no matter what, if it's a new drug. But most RCTs usually focus only on the effectiveness part. They show like, look, our drug is good because it, it, it makes patients stay in remission longer, uh, improving their life. So that's where the that probability will come from. First, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, like in this particular case, yes, for drugs. Uh, I believe that, that that's the way how it works in even here, but uh, at least in the U.S., a drug manufacturer cannot put a drug on the market without showing, using really rigorous RCTs, that the drug is safe and effective. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if this is a program, if this intervention was not a drug, if this was just a I don't know screening program, something that doesn't require like, like such a rigorous type of approval, then you would still need to obtain or at least assume that the probability would change, but you would have to justify it that the screening pro program would you know, improve something, some of these probabilities. Decision tree models at the end you have an ISA. Yes. What do you have at the end of the market model? Also an ISA. Okay. In the decision tree you have comparative arms. And it seems to be one index. Yes. So what do you yes. second? Uh, I, I, I tried to make this distinction, but uh, I will reiterate that. So this model is essentially the one head in the decision tree we had two alternatives. Because they fit on one screen. Uh, now we just focus only on one, but we would essentially do this model twice. One for the new drug, one for the standard of treatment. They would differ in the probabilities and some of the costs. And so we would run each of these models for each strategy separately. And we would, with each cycle, we would calculate the incremental costs for each health state and incremental health effects. At the end of the time horizon for this study, it's 30 years. We would sum all the costs <coughs> and all the health effects for this one strategy. Then we would do the same thing for the other strategy. So we would also get total costs and total effects. And those are the four numbers that we need to calculate in ICER. So there's still a, still a nicer here. In the next slide. It's a very basic question again. What discounts are we talking about? Uh, we need to, if costs happen in the future. So we're only going to increase, increase. Well, yeah, they're going to increase, but in order for, in order for us to pay for future consumption, we don't. So let's say I know that uh, the treatment will cost a thousand rupees a year from now. Today, I don't need 1,000 rupees. I need to put in my bank account 958, say. And with a good interest rate, roughly the same as the discount rate, I will get 1,000 rupees when I need them. So we need to account for this like, different, differential value of money and health over time. If you do that after you've done all your items. <coughs> no, no, you do this. So you do this in every cycle. So now we're in cycle three. So all the costs that were incurred in stage two, all the costs that were incurred in remission, because they were incurred in cycle three, in this case it's year three, we would need to bring those costs to the present value. So you total up the whole thing and then go back to the present value. So but when I for every cycle, there is going to be different costs. For every cycle, there is going to be different costs based on when the cycle is. For first cycle, the cost is different. For second cycle, because it is going to happen. But she's probably not paying. So we have to pay it on the rest of it. So we have to pay it on the rest of it. Yeah, so the, the query was, uh, you know, it's okay if it is a government policy and the government is. So if, if I translate it to one single equation, so how do I, because she in India probably, if I were to talk about the public uh, hospitals, 
So if the, if the patient <coughs> will never have this this money, yeah. she will never get this treatment, yeah. right? But what we assume here is so if she may have the money later, but we don't know that. Right? Like what we assume is even if this patient will get the money, you know, like ten years from now, the amount of money that the patient will have 10 years from now has a certain value today. And the value of money, of that amount of money that's in the future, if it's 10,000 rupees 10 years from now, that amount of money has a certain value today. No, my thing was earnings increase. You know, when families expand, then the capital income might increase. So are we also giving allowance to that kind of thought? That is what the discount rate accounts for. Because the money in the future has higher value than it does today. Well, sorry. Uh, money today has higher value than in the future. So if I need money in the future, I don't need as much money today. So when you bring your funds to this time, what do you Essentially, like any future cost, any future effect, health effects have to be brought to, to the present value just to allow for a fair comparison. Because if one patient has to pay 10,000 rupees today, and another patient has to pay 10,000 rupees 10 years from now, the one who has to pay the money in the future doesn't need the money today, doesn't need as much. So we cannot compare the two payments as 10,000 to 10,000. We have to compare them at the same time point. And that's what the present value does. So in that case, uh, the data that from the amount that data that I enter into stage two, for example, in cycle two and cycle three, uh, would be the true uh, the value but this meant present value for that. Uh, so so let's say we have a patient who's in stage two, two cycles in a row. In each cycle the patient will incur some cost for treatment. I forgot what the number was, let's say 5,000 rupees. So the patient will pay 5,000 rupees in cycle two and cycle three. But we will have to bring both of them to present value. But we will discount the cycle two 5,000 rupees only two periods back, while the cycle three we will discount them three periods back. Exactly. It's essentially like. The, the bottom line is anything happening in the future has to be brought to the present value. Uh, you said we have to run the cycles till all of them end up dead. <laughs> what if a disease doesn't end up as death, just, just a disability? Then how do we calculate it for a lifetime? Uh, like if you do a lifetime analysis, you have to have a death health state. Uh, even if you know something, something, some conditions lead to disability, but eventually people die, with or without disability. So, so if you take the life expectancy into the sure, sure, yeah, yeah, like that. That's exactly how this is done. Like you, disabled people will have a different life expectancy than those who are not, and so they will probably be dying at a higher rate. So for example. I'm talking about dental diseases. Uh -huh. They don't lead to death. Yeah, they, they, they don't. So, um, but there are other co other things. So in this in this example, I consider only uh, the possibility that, possibility that patients can die only from <coughs> this particular disease. But people can die from many causes. So if you do a lifetime type of analysis. You have to allow for all cause mortality, essentially. People get in traffic accidents, but also people just get old and die. And um, in that type of model, even though like the intervention or the, the condition itself doesn't itself lead to death, at some point, like all like when the patients, when the cohort gets old enough, they would they would die.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a very small... Uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And this is a good example of <coughs> when the constant rate of death wouldn't really work. Because people who are 20 years old don't die as often as those who are 90. Um, so in that case, we would have to track the age of the patient and adjust their mortality rate according to uh, life tables, essentially. It's 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 hard. Yeah, I I don't know how to explain it. Like the the recommendation is, uh, in order to be consistent, like we have, we're tracking two main outcomes. We're tracking costs and we're tracking health in whatever measure, and we'll talk about how we measure health in uh, probably after lunch. Maybe I'll start it uh, shortly before lunch. But to get back, so we're tracking two outcomes, money and health. Over time, we know how value of money changes over time. We don't know much how value of health changes over, over time. but just to be consistent in our approach, and because we just don't have a better solution, people use the financial monetary discount rate, even for health, even though many people disagree with this approach. Um, but if, like, if you want an explanation, the explanation is just to be consistent. That's, that's all. Maybe in addictions, you can explain this. Giving up alcohol will save my liver in five years long. But am I ready to give up alcohol? Any alcohol is good. So it's future benefits, but present uh, pleasure, they are not ready for it. That is how it is. Yep, yep. Um, like if with different age, their probabilities would likely change, right? Uh, in this simple example, we try, we just try to ignore it. Uh, but if you were to do this, you would need a tracker of each individual in the cohort and uh, what what their age is, and then you know based on their age in each each cycle, you would. Um, you would adjust the, the, the probability accord, accordingly. It would be very complicated, exactly. That's why I didn't do it. <laughs> uh, I think this is complicated enough. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, absolutely, absolutely. So, again, like this... What we're talking about now is just to explain the, the main concept. It has many flaws, it has many limitations. But once you understand this, like how the state transitions work, you can think of all these additions that you can do to make the model more precise. But as I said before, with most, more precision comes more complexity. And with more complexity, you're more likely to make make a mistake somewhere along the along the the road. Uh, and also, if you will present it to someone, you will have hard time convincing them and explaining it that this is actually set up right. So there is a balance. Uh, there are trade-offs, and to find the right balance is uh, is hard. Uh, but absolutely, like the, the, there's. Especially, like, if you do a lifetime analysis, you need to keep track of people's age. See, sit up, then suppose I take a different disease, like peripheral vascular disease. I take one and one. Can I have an equally simple thing like loss of limb? Can I club it in the final death as amputation or death, like a composite in point? Can uh, Well, amputation doesn't necessarily mean death, right? No. Either or, 
But, but you can have a health state that says amputation. And eventually, even people without legs or, or arms, they will also die. So like, it would be additional health state. They would track how many people actually experience amputation. And eventually, there would be an arrow to the death health state. <laughs> Can it be done without death as a, was it supposed to be only amputation by um, it, it, it depends, but it depends on your time horizon, right? If, if you're only interested how many people will, will experience amputation, and you limit the time horizon for, I don't know, whatever is appropriate, 10 years, 20 years, then sure. Do you... <clears throat> Establish uh, convergence of these transitions, or yeah. just like um, at these values, you just compute the uh, data and give that. Um, no, uh, all models should be before you get the final result. They should be tested for these typical. They should be tested for satisfying the very basic things that happen in reality. For example, if death is one of the health states, like people should, all people should die roughly within 100 years. If that's not the case, and 200 years down the road, like your model is still running, and people are still switching between stage one and stage two, the model is not set up right. Um, so, um, it, it, it always depends on the particular um, particular uh, condition in question that's that's being studied. But for example, if um, in this case we we kind of study the general population because we have the healthy health state, it's not only people who have the condition. Uh, so you would probably compare if your model uh, resembles the incidence rate of this disease that you can find elsewhere. Uh, if it does, good. You know, if you're, for example, looking at pregnancies, like you will see like how often uh, patients can get pregnant. Uh, if it happens, you would probably look in certain age range if you know women are getting pregnant roughly between the age of, I don't know, 20 and 30, uh, maybe 20 and 40. Uh, but if you have 70, 70 year old women getting pregnant, again, the model is really probably not set up well. Uh, this is one, um, um, this is uh, when you have a death state. It's called the absorbing state in the Marco chain. Because once you go there, you cannot come out. So it absorbs. Where you deal with the uh, transition problem, it is uh, easier. What we do is, in the long run, that the transition probability <coughs> should get established. It doesn't change much. It should not change as you change the data about it. That is called convergence of the whole matrix is established. And then you multiply it. That is how we do it. There are occasions where there are non-absorbing states. Where, say, for example, uh, any uh, malnutrition, uh, healthy, mild malnutrition, moderate, and severe malnutrition. Does it mean that severe children should come back to the normal and go back to various uh, states over time? That is called non absorbing states. The way you establish the convergence of these probabilities, when I say convergence, it means that it doesn't change after that. So, there was a paper from the medicine department we did for uh, SLD some time back or for that Hanukkah. That we did the whole thing with the absorbing state, with the 16 years to transmitted data, and so on. So therefore, that you see that the dealing with the non-absorbing, that is what you are saying, amputation and things like that. Yeah, so amputation is also absorbing. Absorbing. So you cannot come back to this. So. So there are occasions like where you, you can come back. There is non-absorbing uh, marker states. That there's some, uh, so therefore the point is how are we going to establish these transition probabilities which gets settled 
that is that is the value for each transition. So you will run the model, iterate the model. Ah, yes, so you will do the Monte Carlo simulations to get that values and then you do the estimation. That will be uh, easy. But what I wanted to tell you is there is a method to get that uh, probabilities when you have a non absorbing state. That, that, that is, uh, you know, one of our PhD here that she was able to do that. Which is possible. We have the link. So, Dr. Jashila, in children, like in school health program, yes. you can have non absorbing. Yes, that is what we established for. The question would be, not only the probability, you would ask the question, how long the child is expected to stay in severe malnutrition? So then you estimate, based on the probability, the estimation, estimate the duration of stay in that state. So that is important. So if I come to that stage, how long that I would be staying there before I go? So in the matrix, you also put the duration. So that will give some idea. So, about the transitions. Right. But this is there, the science is there, this is just there. Okay. I, I think this is still for you. So curiously, like in the statistical model, now so many softwares are coming, like very user friendly, like logistics, very easy to run in the SPSS, the strata, the SPSS. Any, any softwares, any packages to run this model? <laughs> No, I, this is, I, I, I can take this. <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, the, the answer is yes. Um, the fact that we're doing these models in Excel is uh, just because most people have experience with Excel. Uh, but in, in practice, there are only a very few analyses I'm aware of that were actually done in Excel. Uh, the probably most commonly used uh, software for cost effectiveness analysis is called CREATE. Um, it's paid, it's fairly expensive, uh, but it's very user friendly. It's just a clicky thingy, you don't have to code anything. Uh, it, it has a feature that it allows you to visually build a decision tree or a Markov model assign the probabilities, assign the costs, and then you just hit, hit a run button uh, and it spits up all the, all the output for you. Uh, however, that program, because it's so user friendly, it has some limitations. It doesn't allow for some flexibility that some modelers need. And so people who are serious about this kind of thing, uh, they usually use things like R, um, um, C plus, uh, C sharp, essentially any coding language. Like, if you like, you probably already see this is just a one big formula. Uh, maybe with we will tomorrow we will talk about how you bring in uh, the stochastic element when you draw uh, draw values from distributions, uh, but. Any software that can handle that can be used. So if you're familiar with R, use R. If you're familiar in, with C+, you can do it with, with whatever. Essentially, like whatever calculator you have uh, can, can do this. Uh, but also, like if you decide to use some coding language, it just means that you will have a lot of coding to do. If you use TreeH, everything is prepared for you, and you just like click on a bunch of things. How expensive? Uh, I think TreeH, like for students, it's actually not that bad. It's it's maybe like fifty dollars per semester, but it's limited on the number of uh, of uh, health states or terminal states in in a decision tree. Uh, there's a free trial that is very limited and also doesn't allow you to save things. So you can just like try it, but you cannot save it. So once you close your computer, it, everything is gone. Uh, and the, the license, maybe they have different pricing for different countries. I actually haven't explored that. But in the US, I think the license is over $1,500 per year. So it's, it's fairly pricey. Uh, I, I personally, if I, 
have to do th some, something myself, I usually use R. That's what I prefer. It's on your laptop? Yeah. It's yeah. on your laptop. It's on your laptop. It's on your yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't know if I have um, uh, any examples with me, but I'll, I'll think about that. Um, all right, let's let's keep moving. Uh, I think we're actually perfectly on time. Uh, so what Dr. Jessalyn also mentioned before is that so Markov chain or Markov cycle model is this like very simplistic version of it where transition probabilities remain constant. Uh, but we can allow for the transition probabilities to change over time, and that's what we would call a Markov, mo Markov process model. Um, and uh, this still doesn't solve the, 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 the fact that probabilities can change over time. Essentially, with there would be a function of the cycle. It still doesn't solve the problem of the so-called memoryless or no memory of the model, because it doesn't remember where each particular person in the model was, the, in like two cycles before or ten cycles before. Uh, it only knows that in this cycle the probabilities are this, uh, and in next cycle there will, there will be something else. But again, there is a solution. Uh, it's called trackers. Uh, you just each individual has at least one tracker, but you can have many trackers that tracks the experience, that tracks the age of that person, and so on. So there, there are ways how to make these models very precise, but also very complex to implement. So that, that, that was something I just like wanted to mention, that it's, it's an option, but I will not go uh, into much detail. What I would like to talk about now are half cycle corrections. And what this means is that um, when I described the very basic Markov model, uh, the assumption was that everyone stays in, the cycle, in, in, an, in a health state for the entire duration of the cycle, and then switch to a next health state in no time. That's not how it usually works. People, like some people will transition from one health state at the beginning of, very shortly after the beginning of the cycle. Some people will transition close to the end. Many will, will transition in the middle. And half cycle correction is, uh, is a way how to adjust for exactly this. Uh, by the way, this is the, this is the solution of the cycle three uh, membership um, in health states. Um, so I'll sk skip that. And I actually will skip this. I actually don't know what I meant by this. The, um, I'll, I'll just go, go, go here. Uh, so these figures, what they show, by the way, is this, is this working? I don't hear myself. So where did I lose? All right, here it is. Uh, in most models, uh, we count the number of people at the end of the cycle, right before the transition. So essentially, over the duration of the cycle, there is a certain number of people. By the end, we count them, how many there were. We count their incremental cost and incremental uh, health effects they incurred throughout the cycle. And then we discount them to the present value and so on. Um, but because people do switch throughout the cycle, uh, well, if we count them at the end of the cycle, uh, we slightly over, we slightly underestimated the true membership uh, in each health state. If we count membership at the beginning of the cycle, we overestimate it. Ideally, we would like to see a smooth line like here. And a simple solution is just to add a half of a cycle, half of the first cycle worth of value to the, to the very beginning of, uh, 
Well, uh, what I also should have explained is so, so the horizontal axis is um, the number of cycles. And the vertical axis is, uh, in this case, I think it's people alive. So it's, it's slowly decreasing. And uh, how to correct for this either underestimation or overestimation is that if we take the half of the first cycle, if we counted membership at the beginning, which would shift the distribution of the membership such that it it's approx it approximates the smooth line that that is what we would like to see ideally fairly well and why is that like i'll give you an intuition so what we would like to see is is this smooth line if we count membership at the end of the cycle we get these underestimates if we if we count membership at the beginning of a cycle we would get also these like dashed, dashed rectangles. Right. Uh, so even though this is, this is a smooth, continuous line, we can somewhat approximate it with just like straight lines, essentially make these triangles. Right? And when we add them all up, them to the beginning because it's a triangle we get a half of each so it's essentially a it's essentially half of the difference between if we counted membership at the beginning of the cycle and at the end of the cycle uh, then if we added as the initial reward remember when I talked about initial costs and initial effectiveness so if we add the the initial cost, the half of the difference in costs, if we counted them at the beginning and end of the, uh, if we count membership at the beginning and end of the, each cycle, and do the same thing for rewards. If we just add it to the initial reward, we correct the model <laughs> for this imprecision. It's still not perfect, but that's the, usually the way how this is. Uh, this is done, which was I'm maybe a little bit out there, but just think about it. Uh, by the way, this this paper, uh, it's uh, I don't know if it's included, if it's actually printed out, but it definitely should be mentioned, like the reference for it, in in the references. It explains it very well, but I don't want to go into too much detail of it. But that's all I have for this session. So let's let's do questions, and then maybe we can do the the practical example. This is done in the number of individuals in the population, or is it done in the cost? Um, cost remains same. Actually. Very good question. I, I I didn't explain this well. So what you would do, uh, you would essentially do two models. In one, you would calculate the membership at the beginning of each cycle. In the other one, you would count membership at the end of each cycle. You would calculate the total costs and total effectiveness. Then you would take the difference of the two, take half of it, and included it, either sub subtracted it from one of the models or added it to the other one, uh, depending on whether you're underestimating or overestimating the, the total costs and total effectiveness. So it's actually about membership, but the membership then influences how much cost and how much effects are incurred. This one, this one last year, uh, in a life cycle model in that example which you showed, so in that uh, example, uh, yeah, the, yeah, this one. So in this, the death is actually happening because of, only because of uh, cancer. So it's not a strictly a life cycle model per se. It, it, exactly. Exactly, like in here, in this model, uh, we will, in our exercise, we will assume a 30 year time horizon. But we will assume that people cannot die from other reasons other than the, the disease. So if we were to account for the other deaths, then uh, as uh, you were saying, uh, hello would go from the healthy group to the dead. 
Yes. So how would you uh, find out the probability of that that Um Of course, it'll be very small. But yes. So so in this case, um, given. For, for a moment, let's assume that probability of death is constant for all age groups. Just for simplicity, because we don't really track age here. What you would find is, in, in life tables, uh, that usually there is a statistical office of the country. Usually the government tracks this, how many people die each year. So you would get the overall all-cause death rate. But that all-cause death rate includes the deaths from this disease. So you would just subtract that probability, which should be lower. The all cause should be obviously higher probability. And then you would include it here. So from the total population estimate, you find out what's the death rate, and then that's how you find out yeah. the yeah. Yeah. And now, of course, you have to discount this, because this you already figured out in this mark of death, because of this illness, this particular illness, you'll have to minus one. So there yes. is actually 10 yes. causes of yes. death. So one was already printing in the model for rest 9. So from the whole round, you minus this, so you get the rest 9. And then you find the program. That's what I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I follow, but yeah. <laughs> it sounds about right. More questions? I could not understand those graphs. <coughs> Did the half cycle corrections? Yeah. Um, What is the x and the y axis? So x axis is the cycle. So we're in cycle 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. The y axis is essentially the number of people who are still alive. <coughs> and if you count the membership at the beginning of the cycle, you overestimate it because at the beginning of the cycle, everyone's alive. So we have 100%. But there will be some people who die within the first year. But because we measured member, membership in the alive health state, on the first day, of, at the first moment of the cycle, we overestimated how many people were actually alive over the entire cycle. On the other hand, if we measure how many people are still alive at the end of the cycle, at the end of the first year, we would underestimate it because people were just like slowly dying like one by one. But it was it, it doesn't happen that everyone would die either at the very beginning or at the end. Like people just uh, transition from one health state to another continuously somewhat. So if we count the, the number of people in each health state at the beginning of the so of the cycle, we tend to overestimate how many were actually there. If we do it at the end, we underestimate it. And so the, this example shows so the, the like light gray bars show the number of people when we count, count them at the end. And this additional dashed rectangle shows if we counted them at the end. What we would like to ha have is actually half of this rectangle added to it. Because the dark gray people were there in the, in, in the uh, were alive during the cycle, but some of them started to perish. And so we can approximate this smooth line roughly with just, just a rectangle, and then add them all to the side. See, like, this, this thing remains where it is. This thing will just get, get moved here. Right? Oh, this thing will move here, and so on. And so now we have uh, essentially one cycle worth of people who are alive but only for half, like only a half of them. So instead of this teethy, uh, teethy uh, rectangle, we can just have a smooth one half cycle. So that is how we account for the different costs because these people, they were alive and if we counted membership at the 
beginning of the cycle, we included all of them. But uh, if we counted membership at the end of the cycle, we excluded all of them. Do you calculate the area of triangle and like that? Sorry? Do you calculate the area of triangle and like that? Pretty much. So, well, you don't have to really calculate the triangle. You just take a half of the initial population. One percent errors. Yeah. Yeah. In the prevalence studies, we usually take the mid-year population or the July population. You know, when we take the total number of patients of some disease uh -huh. divided by the mid-year population. Mm -hmm. you know, that's prevalence So can we take a median value of between the two uh, states and then find the I would have to think about that. Yeah, I, I don't have I don't have an answer for this on spot. <laughs> um, I would have to think about that. If that's okay. Would you be telling more about it in the practical sense? How do we really do it? Are you telling in the practical sense? How to do the hashtag correction? Uh, I don't plan to because I think it will be overwhelming enough just as is, even without it. But we, we can we can try. Yeah, I, I can briefly mention it at least. Yeah.